Okay, so now we're going to talk about Chapter 4 in the PMBOK Guide, Project Integration Management. Before I get started, let me mention that if you're interested, we have lots of free PMP prep materials at projectprep.org. We've got cheat sheets, full-length practice tests, note cards, lots of stuff that should be pretty helpful. So integration management is really the glue or the bridge between the different process groups. And that'll make more sense as we talk about the processes. Okay, so there are, it uh, looks like, seven processes in the integration management knowledge area. Uh, there's developing the project charter. You're going to do that in initiating when you're kicking the project off. And then in planning, you're going to be developing the project management plan. That's really probably one of our most foundational project management documents. And then in executing, you're going to direct and manage the project work and manage project knowledge. And then in monitor and control project work and perform integrated change control, those are in monitoring and controlling. And then we're, we're going to close the project or phase at the end. Okay, so the project charter, as we develop it, it's authorizing the project and providing the PM with authority. Really, the PM is now going to have authority to start uh, securing resources, spending money, uh, just kicking things off. Now, developing the project management plan, that's integrating subsidiary plans into one comprehensive management plan or project plan. So you're going to have separate plans to document how you're going to manage your schedule, how you're going to manage your costs, your risks. All of those are going to integrate or um, yeah, integrate together into a project management plan. And then you're going to direct and manage the project work. You're just performing the project work that you've documented in the plan. And you're also going to implement approved changes if, if there are some that get approved. You're also going to manage project knowledge, creating and using knowledge to support the project and organization. So as you you know, execute on a project, just data gets generated, lots of data. And so you're trying to figure out which of that is useful uh, for this current project and for future projects. We always learn from uh, every project we do. Then you're going to monitor and control the project work. That's kind of like going to the doctor for your project. You're tracking and reporting on project progress against objectives. And then you could be performing integrated change control. That's reviewing and approving change requests and communicating those decisions. So we can't just um, implement every change that gets proposed by every stakeholder. We have to have some you know, methodical way of reviewing and getting those approved and kind of understanding the impact that they have across the project. So that's all about perform integrated change control. And then we're going to close the project or phase, formally completing things. Uh, in the closing process group, this is the only process um, across any of the knowledge areas in that one. Okay, there's really two key documents we're going to generate in this knowledge area. The project charter authorizes the project and gives the PM authority to start uh, using resources. And then the project management plan is integrating various plans together, and it's really the path to achieve the objectives of the project. It um, documents how we're going to um, accomplish the scope, how we're going to meet the objectives or goals that we've set out to accomplish. Okay, now let's first talk about the project charter again. It's authorizing the project and giving the PM authority. We don't want to move forward with our project until we have this authorization. And in order to create this, there's a few inputs that are required here, just some of the key inputs. There is a uh, could be a business case, which is a cost-benefit analysis. Obviously, it doesn't make sense to do a project if the benefits don't outweigh the cost. And then there could be a benefits management plan describing how benefits from the project will be ma uh, maintained over time. So if we're, whatever the benefits are of the project, we want to make sure that we sustain those and they last for a long time and that they don't die off. And so those two documents together, they're called business documents, the business case and the benefits management plan. There's got to be a business reason and a business benefit for why we're kicking this project off. Another input of the project charter could be an agreement or a variety of agreements. So it could be things like a written contract, a verbal agreement, or an email. Um, anything that could be a basis for getting a project started. It's not official authorization. That's what a project charter is. But these kind of agreements, whether it's just a handshake or an email um, from a boss telling us to get started on a project, those are key inputs to a project charter. But a project charter is still critical. We've got to have somebody signing off saying we can actually uh, move forward with the work. Here's an example of a simple business case. This is really simple for a, a factory automation project. So before we start, this is going to be useful information, a $500,000 project to add automation in our factory could cut labor costs by $1.2 annually. 
So it seems to make sense if we, you know, um, this project is short term and it's only going to cost us 500000 but each year it's expected to cut labor costs by $1.2 million. Seems like it makes sense. Now, we want to compare that benefit and cost to some other projects on occasion if we're kind of trying to decide between several different project options. But um, this business case is going to help us determine if this is a project that we should move forward with. So the business case, again, is going to be an input, or could be an input, to the project charter, the development of that. Here's an example of an agreement. We also said this could be an input to the project charter process. So we maybe just get an email from our boss saying, let's get started on this project right away to remodel the entrance to our store, and I'm willing to approve uh, so much to get it accomplished. That's great to have it in an email. It's important, though, to have a, a charter that you've uh, also got developed and they get signed off on. That really makes everything official. Okay, so after we've developed the project charter, in planning, we're going to work on our project management plan. It's really the central project document. It shows you how the project is going to get completed, and it's progressively elaborated. If you recall, what that means is that we're going to add detail to the plan over time. We're not going to know everything at the start of the project. So we elaborate or I continue to develop it. And it should be consistent with a program plan or a portfolio plan if that exists. Remember, if we're working on a project underneath a program or a portfolio, we want to make sure we align upwards. So the project management plan is really going to look at everything. Uh, cost, schedule, scope, human resources, communications, risks. It's looking at all of those things. And if you recall, it's kind of a comprehensive plan that includes a bunch of subsidiary plans underneath it. So here's showing you on the left everything in the in the project management plan. And notice that it, and this is at least the way I remember it, um, anything that ends with plan or baseline is in the project management plan. So the cost baseline, the scope baseline, and also the quality management plan, the schedule management plan. All of those things become inputs to the project management plan. They're part of the project management plan. And if you look at the things on the right, obviously they don't end in plan or baseline, so they're not part of the project management plan. That's the way that I remember it. Now here's how we, you know, the, we use the plan and develop it over the course of the project. In planning, we obviously create it. In executing, we're completing the work in the plan. And then in monitoring and controlling, we're comparing our plan against what actually happened. We want to see how things are going. Remember, monitoring and controlling is kind of like going to the doctor. Okay, so now that we've talked about the project charter and the project management plan, another important concept in this chapter is change management. So oftentimes on projects, things don't go as planned, so we have to make adjustments to it. But we have to manage those changes in a methodical way. So integrated change control is managing changes to deliverables, pro, uh, project documents, and etc. And you're th it's called integrated because you're thinking about, even though it may be a small change, you want to think about it in an integrated way. You want to think, how is this change, even if it's small, going to affect other areas of my project? Integrated change control. So change can be conducted at any time during a project, and changes can be requested by any stakeholder. It doesn't mean that all, they're going to get, all of them are going to get approved. It just can be requested by anyone. They must be written. They can't just be verbal. You want to make sure you're carefully writing down and tracking changes in a spreadsheet or something. It should also include estimated time and cost impacts. We want to understand, if we make this change, what will the impacts be? How is it going to affect our project? And only approved changes should go into a revised baseline. And we're going to talk what a baseline is. It's basically an approved plan, a baseline, what we're going to measure ourselves against as we start executing on the project. So here's an example of integrated change control. It's Remember, it's allowing changes to be considered in the context of the overall project plans. So here's an example. If we change the flooring material on a construction project after we're already, you know, uh, moving forward, and we've maybe already put some floor down, do we need to change the paint color? It's a good question. If we change the flooring material, there may be impacts beyond just the floor itself. We may have to think about, do we need to change the paint color of the wall to match that flooring material? That's thinking about a change in an integrated way. And here's to take it a step further. If we change the paint color, do we need to change the appliances? Maybe we were 
picking our appliances based on the color of the walls that we were um, planning to paint. That would be integrated change control, thinking about an individual change in the context of the overall project plans. So as we conduct change management, we're going to be tracking changes in a change log. And this is just a simple example of it. It's um, actually this was um, this particular change log we're going to use in class. But really what you you need to talk about is what the description of the change is, when it was submitted, who submitted it, when it was reviewed, if it got approved or not, what's the status of it, uh, any additional comments. We just need to track changes and monitor them and make sure we're communicating decisions, especially to those affected stakeholders and um, even more so to the stakeholders that requested them. We want to keep them in the loop on changes. Uh, still on change management here, a change control board is the group that reviews changes in an integrated fashion. They approve or reject them and then record and communicate decisions. Typically the sponsor is going to be a key member of the change control board, um, you know, but not always. Typically though that would make sense, especially if they're funding the project and driving it forward. Now, one thing that we need to talk about is to distinguish between change control or change management and configuration control. So change control is changes to documents, deliverables, or baselines of the project. They're project-related changes. Configuration control is different, though. It's changes to the physical characteristics of a product. If you think about the Apple iPhone, they manage configuration changes to versions of the iOS. Those are product-related changes. 